first of all, I just want to welcome everyone. Happy World Wetlands Day. Um, I first want to thank you all for joining us today. My name is Christine Oblock. I'm the Clean Water Federal Field Director of Environment okay. America, and I am so glad to be with you all virtually today. We're excited to have a wide array of guest speakers, all speaking to the importance of clean water protections. Um, so we'll have our guests speak first, and then we'll hold time for questions at the end. However, you can use the Q&A function uh, to ask your questions ahead of time or post them in the chat. Um, this year, the Clean Water Act will celebrate its 50th anniversary. Uh, so today we'll be looking at what the act has done for our nation's waterways over the last 50 years, and then what's ahead for this bedrock protection in the next few months, and then also the next 50 years of the Clean Water Act. Um, I'd like to briefly introduce our speakers. We're joined today by uh, John Rumpler, Environment America's Clean Water Program Director, Ted Manning, Patagonia's Director of Fly Fishing, Caitlin Lovell, the City of Portland's Regulatory Strategy and Remediation Division Manager, Mandy McKay, Sierra Nevada Brewing Company's Director of Social Responsibility, Eric Fuchs, Understanding Ag's Source Water Protection Technician, and Carl Berg from Surfrider Foundation, uh, who's co the Kauai Chapter Research Scientist. Um, as promised, we'll also have some opportunities to take action to protect our water throughout the, the webinar. Um, so I'll start us off by passing things to John Rumpler, who leads Environment America's Clean Water Program. Uh, John has a long track record of working to defend our waters from drinking water to our rivers and streams. Uh, he's coordinated several successful campaigns to win a cleanup plan for the Chesapeake Bay, enact the federal clean water rule, and implement state policies to curb runoff pollution. Uh, he'll be walking us briefly through some history of the act. So thank you, John. Go ahead and take it away. Absolutely. Thanks, Christine. Uh, again, great to be here, and thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, John Rumpler, Clean Water Program Director for Environment America. You know, I think before we talk about the act, it's important to remember why, why we have a Clean Water Act, and I think it goes to all of the different reasons that we, we cherish clean water. Um, you know, from the Willamette River uh, in Puget Sound in the Northwest to the Everglades uh, in Florida, uh, to the Chesapeake Bay and the Great Lakes and rivers and lakes and streams all across the country in between, um, we rely on these waterways for our ecosystems, for our quality of life, for recreation, um, for business, as you'll hear from some of our other speakers, um, and, and our sense of place, right? I grew up in Rhode Island, the ocean state, and, you know, water defined um, uh, uh, the place wh where I where I grew up, and that's that's true in so many places, um, not to mention the fact that, of course, we rely on water for drinking water, right? We need safe drinking water for our health as well, um, places we can go swimming and fishing and so forth. And in fact, the Clean Water Act, when it was passed 50 years ago today, overwhelmingly with bipartisan support, um, had a goal of making all of our waterways safe for swimming and for fishing and providing safe drinking water for all Americans. And it provided an incredible array of tools for us to get there. For the first time, we would have nationally enforceable pollution limits that would actually say how much pollution could be dumped into our rivers based on water quality standards and based on technology. And the idea is that those, those limits would be ratcheted down over time. And in fact, the Clean Water Act set as a goal that we would end direct discharges of pollution by 1985. Well, we're a little late in getting towards that goal, but the tools are there, including these pollution limits. In addition to that, for um, enforceable pollution limits for any particular permitted facility, like a factory or a sewage treatment plant, et cetera, the Act also provides for cleanup plans for whole watersheds, like the Chesapeake Bay, like Puget Sound, setting limits based on water quality so that fish can swim, so it's safe for swimming, et cetera, and so forth. Um, this is an incredible tool often referred to as total maximum daily load in the wonky speak of the Clean Water Act, a really powerful tool that needs to be implemented better, but a great program. A third thing in the Clean Water Act, can you imagine Congress passing this law today? It says in the Clean Water Act that if Congress, and rather if state, state and and, and federal uh, enforcement agencies do not enforce these 
limits on pollution that citizens can go to court and sue polluters to get them to stop their illegal discharges of pollutants. That's an incredible tool. Uh, Environment America, but also many other organizations have used the citizen suit provision countless times to get polluters to stop dumping into our waterways, leading to dramatic improvements uh, in clean water. The Clean Water Act also established programs of funding. Um, so it's not all just carrot, uh, all just stick. There are some carrots. Um, we've had billions of gallons of sewage overflows going into our rivers, lakes, and streams. That's a public problem that needs to be solved. And now through the Clean Water State Revolving Fund, again, established through the Clean Water Act, we now have funding going to help reduce that pollution. We, of course, need more of it, and we've been advocating for more of it, but the tools are there. And finally, the Clean Water Act actually has a tool to keep our clean waters clean, because remember, not all of our waters are polluted. Um, under the anti-degradation provisions of the Clean Water Act, we can give special protections to waterways that are key sources of drinking water, fishing, recreation, and have other exceptional values to actually prevent pollution from entering these rivers and streams in the first place. What an incredible act that we have for 50 years that's already made some progress. That's great. There are challenges ahead though. Uh, what are those challenges? Well, the good news is that we've reduced some of the pollution from traditional sources, like a pipe from a factory going into a river. But there are other sources of pollution that continue to plague us and are emerging as greater threats. Um, as I'm sure Eric can tell us about later, the rise of factory farms and the consolidation of corporate agribusiness has led to an incredible flow of pollutants from manure and commercial fertilizer going into our waterways, exacerbating dead zones, um, uh, toxic algal outbreaks in places like Lake Erie and so forth and so on. Uh, climate change has also exacerbated many of our water woes from drought on the one hand in the southwest to flooding in the east coast. And all of these things, of course, uh, impact our waterways directly. Um, we have emerging contaminants uh, like these forever chemicals that many of you have heard about called PFAS that are a great risk to both human health and the ecosystem we don't yet have all of the tools in place and regulations under the Clean Water Act to ensure that we can halt the flow of those toxic chemicals into our waterways. But looking backwards at the success and looking forward at some of these challenges, the key thing to remember is the Clean Water Act will only work for us if it applies to the waterways we care about. That is to say, if there is a river somewhere or a stream or a wetland, if it is not covered by the Clean Water Act, then some polluter can dump toxic chemicals or pave over those wetlands and there's nothing that the federal government or we as citizens under the citizen suit of the Clean Water Act can do to stop them. And that's why Environment America and many business allies and local elected officials and farmers and many, many others have been working now for more than a decade to ensure that all of our waterways are protected by the Clean Water Act. Um, I won't go through the 20 year history of the jurisdiction of the Clean Water Act stemming back to cases in the Supreme Court in 2001 and 2006, but I will say that in 2015, we won something called the Clean Water Rule that restored a lot of these protections that was then rescinded and replaced by the Trump administration with something we call the Dirty Water Rule, AKA the Navigable Waters Protection Rule. But we'll just call it the Dirty Water Rule because it left thousands and thousands of streams and wetlands that help provide drinking water to millions of Americans without protection of the act. And the reason I bring this up right now is just what Christine was getting at at the beginning. EPA is now has a, an open comment period uh, which closes on Monday, February 7th, for its proposal to officially close the door on this dirty water rule. And this is our opportunity to clearly tell the Environmental Protection Agency that we want Clean Water Act protections restored for all of our streams, all of our wetlands, indeed, all of our waterways upon which Americans rely. So 
That's a quick snapshot of the Clean Water Act at 50 and the challenges in front of us today. Thanks, John. And I'm actually going to go ahead and put in the chat the link to be able to add your voice to our petition that will be part of that public comment period to the EPA. So we'll be submitting that next Monday as part of the um, as, at the comment period. So go ahead and add your name. And that would be that'd be great. Uh, next, we'll have we'll hear from uh, Ted Manning, who's the director of fly fishing for Patagonia. Go ahead, Ted. Good morning, or I suppose good afternoon for a lot of you. Uh, my name is Ted Manning. I use he, him pronouns, and I am an extremely proud employee here at Patagonia. Before I get going too far, really would like to thank Christine and John for a chance to use my voice and the industry behind me to advocate for this critical piece of legislation. It's been important in my career, my life, and my family, and I am really honored to get a chance to, to lean in and, and do what I can to help protect it. Uh, in the spirit of perhaps not knowing what Patagonia is, brief introduction, we're not the apparel company. We too turned 50 this year. What an interesting coincidence. And in the act of turning 50, you look backwards at all the great work you've done, but you've got enough time in front of you to get the work you haven't gotten to yet still underway. And maybe in that same sense, that's where the Clean Water Act finds itself. 50 years of doing great work. And now we have a chance to put it in place for 50 years of even greater protection for this thing that's so critical to our lives and our families and, and our communities. Patagonia builds product for activists and athletes. I think you're all probably aware of that. We really focus on human powered sports and we divide our business into five business units. And I get to represent the rivers business unit today. A Patagonia business unit is defined by the intersection of what we make and the community we intend to impact. And so the team I'm representing, we create equipment. So packs and travel gear, we create accessories, hats and gloves and beanies, lots of those and fly fishing. And the community we impact is, the, is those who uh, advocate and recreate in our clean and wild waters in North America. So my job is as much about ensuring that there's activism and impact in that community before it's about building a waiter or a pack or a, or a thing to, to sell you. Our mission statement, we are in business to save our home planet. This isn't something that we take lightly. And we've been in this game for an awfully long time. In 2012, we took steps to become a California benefit corporation so that we could really blend and enshrine in our articles of incorporation, our commitment to business and conservation. Again, we aren't messing around. And as we stand here today, we really believe that it's for-profit businesses that have to begin to lead the way to protect the environment for this and for future generations. This company was founded on, on that belief and the idea that if we enable people to explore these wild places and protect them, that they align with us on their activism and ultimately help us lift them up and ensure that they're protected. And why? This is not This is the hardest way to build product. It'd be easy to look the other way. Why does Patagonia take this route? Why are all of us here today to represent this? There, there are simpler paths. You know, and I think we, we collectively, we're here because we care. And we're here because we, we know we must, we know someone must, and we're here because we collectively believe that our businesses and our sectors have a responsibility to protect our communities. And we're here today and Patagonia is here today because it really understands the Clean Water Act as an integral part of the outdoor recreation economy. I will talk about protecting trout in shady corners of, of beautiful streams all day long. And, and I think that's important. And I will talk to you about the legacy of my children. And I think that's important. But I think what really matters is the idea that at the foundation of conservation are sustainable communities and thriving, thriving sustainable economies. The outdoor recreation economy is a measure of the annual spending in the United States on our outdoor gear and experiences. So if you think packs and ski passes, campsites and days on the river, that is what the outdoor recreation economy is. It's over $887 billion in revenue spent It employs about 7.6 million people. Just to give us some comparison, as Americans, we spend annually about $304 billion on all types of gas and fuel. So the out-direct economy is over twice that. And as Americans, we spend about $467 billion on pharmaceuticals. The out-direct economy is a little less than twice that. This is not, these aren't small numbers. This thing scales up relatively quickly. In California alone, 700,000 Californians are employed by this economy. 30, over 30 billion in wages and salaries and 92 billion in spending. Big, is a relatively big piece of a really large state. And in here in California, the dirty water rule has left exposed two thirds, two thirds of our streams 
are exposed currently, not okay. These streams are necessary for healthy fisheries. These streams are necessary for healthy environment and they drive healthy business. Let's come one more, one more set of data underneath that. We have seen this boom of participants. Americans are flocking outdoors and fishing alone. 55 million people went fishing last year. 55 million people were setting a record. 18% of the US population got out and went fishing last year. We are flocking back to these wild places because we know that they hold us in this time and they represent a solace to what's going on around us. These folks fished 18 times per person. I didn't, I work in the industry and I barely fished 18 times per person, right? They, they, our constituencies, our communities are telling us that these places are important through their acts all the time. And, and critical to the 18 times a year and critical to the 55 million people who went and, and went in a total of 969 million times are healthy rivers and critical to healthy rivers are healthy sources. And we know this, the current opportunity that we've got right now to define and protect headwaters and wetlands, the ephemeral headwaters of these places, the time is now. By the EPA's own estimate, over half, over half of our nation's stream miles start in waters that are classified as ephemeral and are currently unprotected. And without that protection, everything downstream continues to be exposed and vulnerable. Our families, our communities, our businesses, our economies, exposed and vulnerable to the absence of protection at the origins of our mighty, mighty, mighty rivers. When, Cong when Congress established the Clean Water Act in 72, it, it, it set an objective early. The, the language is there to restore and maintain the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of our nation's waters from tip to tail, source to sea. And we know that, and we cannot afford to go backwards. Our time is now. We have more people in these places than ever, and they're seeing the value. The crisis is as urgent as possible, and the current administration has the opportunity to right the wrongs and set us on a course in our future. Our time is now. These places need our protection. And yes, we will protect a multitude of species that are in these ecosystems, and we will protect the health of communities across the nation. And all of those are true. But underneath that, we will protect one of the most critical economic forces that we have, the one that builds sustainable communities, the one that doesn't extract to come back, the one that is sustainable. In Patagonia's opinion, what is good for our waters from wetland to sea is good for our nation, and we are out of time. The time to act is now. Thank you. Thanks, Ted. So we'll move from, from California and the business angle just up the West Coast, and we'll go to Caitlin Lovell in uh, the city of Portland. Go ahead, Caitlin. Good morning from Oregon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. And a special shout out to Environment America for pulling this esteemed panel together today, especially on World Wetlands Day, and to John for pronouncing Willamette correctly. <laughs> Props for that. Um, I uh, am both a scientist and a lawyer working for the city of Portland. I work in the stormwater and sewer utility for the uh, city, and we're responsible for the city's watersheds. And a lot of people really uh, write off urban areas and cities and consider them sacrifice zones. It's almost as if they expect the rivers and streams there to be dirty and to continue to be dirty. And we're really working hard to dispel that for a number of different reasons. If you look at most major cities, they're located at these critical mouths of rivers. Uh, they were located there historically because of the strong economic uh, positioning that that had, as well as the natural resources that it provided. And now as we grow and we look ahead, the next 50 years, the next 100 years, especially with climate change, we're really seeing these increasing pressures of densification and urbanization um, that is continuing to strain these rivers and streams, and yet our reliance on them and our need for them to be clean and healthy is actually increasing, not decreasing. So in Portland, uh, we're located at the fourth and 19th largest rivers in the United States, the so Columbia and the Willamette Rivers. It's an incredibly dynamic location. Um, we drain at sort of sit at almost the, the bottom of the drainage of an area the size of France. And so to think of our small rivers and streams as really contributing to that dynamic ecological and economic system. And then if you layer on top of it, the 1.5 million people that live here and depend on those streams and the health of those streams for their own well-being, it really adds up to uh, the need for the standardized federal level of protection to make sure that not only are our citizens healthy and well uh, in our environment, but also everybody upstream that's contributing to what we receive downstream. 
So um, the Willamette and Columbia Rivers are home to 16 ESA listed species, Endangered Species Act listed species. We have the largest concentration of ESA listed species of any major city on the West Coast. We take that responsibility very seriously. In addition, we have culturally significant species of lamprey as well as sturgeon. And lamprey and sturgeon are as old as the dinosaurs. They're still here. Uh, and I quite frankly don't know how much longer given the way uh, their declines are projected. This new rule that we have, the, the clean water rule, um, really builds on best available science. And what I really love about my job is the ability to take that science, to take our scientists and the work that they do and add to it, and then translate that into actions, programs, and policies at the city to help us comply. Um, we know that two thirds of our watershed, so 60% of our rivers and streams are characterized as intermittent and ephemeral. These are at the heart of this new rule. And this is really critical to how we manage our city. When people in Portland are asked why they live in Portland, the environment tops the list every time. It is such a critical piece to what attracts people here, their sense of livability and health. But as a utility, we rely on these drainages. We call them drainages. It's such a, an archaic term, but these streams and rivers and wetlands to really manage our rain. And that rainfall pattern is changing. And as it changes, where rivers move and how they flood also changes. And so it's really critical that we are looking ahead to what kind of um, behavior and patterns and protections that we need to not only protect the people in Portland, but protect those rivers and streams um, and the, the fish and wildlife that rely on them. Uh, I mentioned that Portland's at the bottom of the watershed. And so making sure that these federal protections also prevent pollution from coming into the system. It is so much easier for us to keep clean water clean than it is for us to receive a whole lot of dirty water and then be held to a standard to try to make it cleaner, especially when you're talking about rivers with the volume of the, you know, the Willamette at 600,000 CFS. Um, that's the record flood, sorry. That's not our normal <laughs> volume. Um, one of the key parts of this uh, that I wanna convey is that the Clean Water Act, uh, the Waters of the US rule works in municipal areas. Uh, a lot of people think that it's too much of a regulatory burden, that it really prohibits expansion and development. And we have shown over the years that we can actually grow as a city, we can improve the environment, we can create jobs, and we can improve the livability and the health of our citizens in the process. And in fact, it's actually critical. If you look at green infrastructure, sort of the, the river streams and trees and riparian areas that we have, that is a critical piece of uh, the climate resiliency that we need to build to protect human health, to, to prevent urban heat island, to prevent flooding. So we're really seeing the connection between all of that. But there are some critical exclusions in the Clean Water Act. Wastewater systems, for example, um, we're encouraging stormwater systems to also be excluded, the, the constructed systems. Those are small tweaks that go a long way to making this rule work in urban areas. And then finally, um, it, a little wonky for folks who might not have read the rule in its entirety, but there's a real critical new component or a reaffirm, reaffirmed component of this rule called the significant nexus test. Um, unfortunately, what that test, it, it's really important and it will lead to a lot of great protections, but those protections come later. So one of our positions with this new rule is that those um, significant nexus decisions, there are some that can be made today. And we think that those decisions are made today that 60% that of ephemeral and intermittent streams in Portland will be protected today instead of waiting on a case-by-case -case basis or until uh, the core and EPA come up with a later rule, um, we wanna see those protected today so they don't degrade. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you for the time. Thanks, Caitlin. Um, excellent perspective. Um, and then we'll we'll pass it over to Mandy McKay with Sierra Nevada Brewing Company. Go ahead, Mandy. All right. Thanks, Christine. And thanks so much for having me and everyone else on the panel and happy World Wetlands Day. Glad to be here. Um, so let's see, just real brief introduction. So Sierra Nevada's um, been around since 1980. Uh, we're headquartered in Chico, California, so Northern California. 
Um, and then we also have a second brewery out in Western North Carolina, just outside of Asheville, North Carolina. Um, so I like to start with, I mean, it seems pretty obvious maybe, um, you know, if you're familiar with beer, um, you know, we're, we're one of the largest craft brewers in the country. And um, honestly, one of the larger brewers, even in brewing in general, we're small compared to, you know, the ABs and the Miller Coors of the world, but we're a relatively large brewery. Um, especially in craft. And so with most beverage manufacturers, not just breweries, but particularly with breweries, you know, water makes up 95% of our product. Um, so it's, it's beyond essential, right? So we, we don't even, it's arguably our most important raw material. So we spend a lot of time thinking about water, its availability, its quality, the sourcing, we advocate for protections and anything that we can do to contribute to long-term resiliency of the source and quality of that water. Um, again, because it's truly the backbone of our company and really the whole industry, craft beer or beverage in general, right? So it's pretty obvious, um, I think, why we, we're committed because, um, again, it's, it's truly fundamental to our company and our brewery's success. Um, so, you know, and we're also part of, I should mention, we're part of a, another coalition that works with Environment America called Brewers for Clean Water. And that's about a couple hundred craft breweries that are dedicated to the same um, and supporting the Clean Water Act, supporting the clarity and the codifying of the rules um, and really making it a permanent and strong and robust regulation for all sources of water. Um, and so, so that's something else that we spend a lot of time with that, that coalition that's great. Um, so there's some, some industry support behind this work as well. Um, you know, we, so we, Sierra Nevada is in support of the intent of the 2015 rule that John talked about um, that was attempting to further define, you know, waters of the United States. Um, and we did oppose the navigable waters protection rule um, because we really felt that it undermined the very foundation of the Clean Water Act. Um, and so very glad to see this back um, up for discussion in this, the open period now for comment because um, we really want to see a durable and long-standing uh, definition so that we can stop kind of this back and forth and we really need long-term uh, protections. We can't, we can't sort of keep doing the back and forth because as others have mentioned, you know, there's a lot at risk here um, if we don't take the steps um, to protect now. So beyond, beyond thinking about you know, clean water for our own products and our, you know, for our needs as a business, we deeply understand and appreciate and part of the history of our company is that interconnectedness of waterways, uh, including wetlands and streams to each other, uh, as well as the larger water ecosystem that provides wildlife habitat and biodiversity and the role that wetlands play in mitigating climate change impacts and sequestering carbon. So we recognize all the interconnectedness of our waterways um, and again, the kind of sort of the philosophy of our company and, and why I've been involved in sustainability at Sierra Nevada for almost 15 years is we understand that outside of our own, you know, business need. If we don't have healthy communities, we don't have healthy ecosystems, a business cannot thrive either. So it kind of goes outside of our four walls, but it's also connected. Um, and then not to mention the outdoor recreation value, um, which Ted already talked about, Patagonia. Um, craft beer and, you know, Sierra Nevada, certainly we kind of see ourselves as a adjacent or sister industry to outdoor recreation because they kind of go hand in hand sometimes. I don't, I don't encourage drinking and, you know, uh, anything dangerous where you might get hurt, but there's a lot that um, is overlapping there. And so certainly with our company, you know, we've had a long history of working with river partners and other organizations around water specifically, and then that does tie over into the outdoor recreation. Um, as others have mentioned, so non-abutting wetlands and streams, including ephemeral streams, those have biological, chemical, physical connections to navigable waterways. So even if you can't visually see them, I'm sure, I think Carl may probably will bring some of this in, um, but we absolutely think those should be included in the definition of waters of the United States. Um, that, that connection that I think Caitlin was also talking about. Um, like many food manufacturers, so we, we do consider ourselves, you know, we make beer, but we're an ag agriculture based uh, industry, right? So our other primary ingredients are hops and barley and other ag based raw materials. Um, and so, you know, our farmers, the, the, the farmers that we work with, our hop and barley farmers, 
they're also our partners. And, and so we, we do respect and appreciate that there's certain farming practices that have remained excluded um, from the act. However, we can't necessarily, you know, discount those connections and that coverage of all water sources that we're trying to aim for. So it's one of those interesting partnerships because we've got to all get on the same page uh, with what we mean by how water is connected, where it flows, and what those impacts have. And so I think, again, I'm glad for this open session now and that we're trying to find a durable and longstanding definition that isn't too burdensome to, you know, to abide by, but fully protects all of those sources because they're all connected. Um, so it's, a, it's been an interesting um, back and forth because again, our farmers are also really incredible partners for us as a company, as an industry. Um, and then lastly, we support, I mean, I would like, to, it's not really in the co current conversation now, but uh, stronger protections for groundwater. Um, at our two breweries, so in Chico, California, uh, all of our water, all of our brewing water and all of the town's water is all groundwater. Um, so it's certainly something we think a lot about. And then at the, our brewery in Western North Carolina, it's surface water. So we think about water both ways. Uh, and again, it's all connected, whether you're talking about groundwater or surface water. Um, and so it would really be great to see more groundwater inclusion as well. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it there. And if there's questions, we can keep going. So thanks again. Appreciate everyone listening and being here. Excellent. Thanks, Mandy. Um, and good reminder to put any questions that you have in the chat, or you can use the Q&A function, and that'll um, pop them up for all of the speakers to be able to see. I'll say having been to the Asheville Brewery with the surrounding bike tracks, I can fully uh, endorse your overlap of uh, outdoor activity and, <laughs> and brewing. Um, great. And then we're going to go to Eric Fuchs next. And Eric is in the middle of Missouri in a snowstorm. So we have some bandwidth issues. So um, thanks everyone for, for bearing with us for that. And we'll, we'll hope that it, it goes well. Go ahead. Thanks, Eric. Christine. And yeah, thanks, Christine. And thanks for the shout out, John. As I uh, said, I apologize for not having the video on. We're kind of, I'm in the middle of Southeast Missouri on actually my farm right now, watching it sleet and snow and all that nasty stuff. So to, just to give you a little background on me, which kind of shows the story of where I come into this. So I work for a company called Understanding Ag as a consultant, a soil health consultant, and I work in the water side as well. But anybody that's never heard of that company, I don't know if you watched the movie Kiss the Ground. Uh, there's a gentleman named Gabe Brown and Ray Archuleta. That's the company they started. I'm fortunate enough to be able to work with them, consult all over the United States, and we're active around the world as well. So a little background on that. So I've, I've been in agriculture all my life. Uh, mainly uh, livestock. We raise sheep and cattle and uh, I've always been a little bit, as I call, weird. Uh, did, have done things different from the agriculture side, not conventional. Uh, we, we do uh, manage regeneratively now. I'm holistically trained as well. So I'm conventionally educated. So I've spent the last 25 years trying to unlearn what I have learned from college to be in the regenerative world. With that, about eight or nine years ago, I took a job with Missouri Rural Water Association as a source water protection technician. So I was the guy that tried to keep drinking water clean before it became drinking water. And I joke within about, so, so with that, I, I'm certified a, a water operator distribution and I worked in the wastewater side too. So with that said, after about a month on the job, I was just astounded that all the problems that were coming from the non-point source from agriculture. So, you know, I had the agriculture side of it and, and everybody, it was a whispering campaign as, oh my gosh, we can't, we can't call out agriculture. We can't say what the true problems are. And I will unequivocally say that in my experience in Missouri and around the country, 95% or more of the problems in water quality, algal blooms, nitrogen, phosphorus, everything comes from non-point source pollution. And what really astounded me is that I got involved with the regulatory side and there was a lot of small towns that were spending or being forced to spend millions to upgrade their wastewater plants for just a tiny bit more nitrogen or a tiny bit more phosphorus when an acre of corn ground right across the road from them gave more than their town did in the entire year. So I, it, it became a quest for me to let's, let's look at the 
true problem. And, and, and I understood it. You know, the point source was regulated, the non-points not. But it really, what I saw is the destruction of rural America by the, the heavy burdensome regulations on stuff that was not truly the problem. So I started getting involved more with our lobbyists in National Rural Water, doing quite a bit more speaking. And, and I could, per se, get away with things that some people can't because of my agriculture background to call things out that, you know, that needed to be called out got involved then with Gabe and Ray and they asked me about seven or eight months ago to come work for them as a consultant. Uh, if you can ever say I've got a dream job, I've got a dream job. And uh, the fact is that I'm probably a little bit different. I'm not completely on the regulatory side or, or a fan of it. Sometimes we are kind of trying to go from the other side. Uh, I, I, and Mandy had touched on this a little bit. I think it's the consumer's responsibility and it's a, a big company's responsibility, I think, to, to start forcing a change of the way they source uh, products, the way they source food from a regenerative standpoint. Because uh, what I have noticed is the problems are not getting better. You know, we have cleaned up very, very a lot the point source. I mean, we still have infrastructure issues. We still have things that can be spent on that. But the, the, the emphasis needs to be on the non-point. And but because the problems in, in the world, the problems in soil health, the problems in dead zones, the problems with nitrogen and phosphorus are not getting better. They're getting worse. And it is perpetuated by a lot of the large ag groups. I, I say that the uh, farmer, for the most part, is just trying to do what he knows best. He doesn't know what he doesn't know. But the fact is there has to be a change and it has to be, it has to be quick and it has to be fast because things are, things are not getting better. So our company, that's, you know, I'm going to put a shameless plug in. We, we consult all over the, the country and we give a very good product, but we are starting to go down the route of the consumer side because I think that's what needs to make the everlasting change. And so I'm honored to be a part of this group. I think agriculture has caused the problems, but we are going to have to have agriculture solve the problems. Uh, there's a lot of different ways we can do that. Uh, I do also see, I've seen some questions in the chat about litigation. I don't really have a problem with litigation as well. I think there's, there's some issues here where people need to be held responsible for what's going on with the pollution, you know? And so I know that's kind of a big circle to come back and explain what I do, but we are passionate about what we do. We are passionate about regenerative agriculture. And I have seen firsthand that what we do can absolutely change what comes off this land in regards to nitrogen, phosphorus, sediments, you know, the uh, destruction of our water, groundwater, the things we're doing with it. This is the solution. This way of farming is the solution. It's not hard, it's not expensive, but it is a drastic change in mindset on what's been done and what we've told has been right for a lot, a lot of years. So once again, thanks to all of you for having me here and, and, and it's, it's a privilege working with a group like this. Thanks Eric, especially uh, for overcoming sleet and snow and bad bandwidth. Um, now we're going to go to the very opposite side of our uh, weather spectrum. We're going to Carl Berg, who's joining us from Hawaii. Carl's with the uh, Surfrider Foundation, and he's a research scientist. So go ahead, Carl. Thanks. Okay. Can you see this? Are you able to see my slides? Not yet. Okay. Maybe you have to open it up again? Yes. I think you need to press the share button and open. Okay. Now let's see. Okay, uh, who is, I represent the Surfrider Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization dedicated to projection of the world's ocean waves and beaches. They are the, the down part of the watershed initiative. The Surfrider Foundation uh, has about 81 chapters, as you see here, all around the nation. And one of the big things that we do is work with the Clean Water Initiative to protect our water. And again, we're really focused on the ocean side, but what we have found through the years is that the pollution is coming mainly 
uh, well, mainly from the, the land, from the streams, from the rivers, but also from injection wells, sewage treatment plants, and of course, the great big oil spills. As part of this, the Surf Rider has a volunteer water testing program with over 50 labs all around the Blue Water Task Force. And this is really set up to protect public health at the beach and to bring awareness of local pollution problems and to come upon uh, solutions. Uh, this map shows you the, uh, the states in blue where we have water testing labs, although because of COVID, uh, we in Hawaii, <clears throat> Hawaii shut down our lab for a little bit. And so the, this is not accurate, but you can see we're well covered all around the coastal areas. Um, and what the Blue Water Task Force does is to go out and test the waters around the creeks and river mouths, uh, stormwater discharge. We have uh, sampling programs that basically complement agency run things. We're not trying to replace the state or the county uh, sampling programs, but we're trying to uh, identify gaps in their testing and go out and then bring that information to them for some sort of remediation. Most of what we do is testing for fecal indicating bacteria, but that's not exclusively. Here is just a, a quick map of the island of Kauai. It's about 500 square miles, a tiny island with mountains in the middle and a huge Carl, coastline that's accessible. Sorry, sorry to interrupt Carl, but we still can't see the screen. So the, um, the maps that you're referencing, we, we don't see them. So you wanna try one that. more time? Okay, well then I'll, I'll jump out of here and go back to live. Can you see me? Yep, we can see you. Okay, so the anyways, the Surfrider Foundation has all, um, all these water crest testing labs and they're mainly run by citizen scientists. And I, I find that's an interesting term because I'm a citizen. I'm also a professional scientist with 50 years in, in the field. And many of our uh, laboratories are overseen or run by real life scientists. But we have a hard time getting the, um, not the EPA, but the local governments to look at what we're doing in an effective way. Because of that, uh, we have re uh, resorted to litigation because, and where I'm coming from in this talk, is that if scientists can get out there and actually show and measure in a scientific fashion that these waters are polluted, they can then go and look at the source tracking, find out where it's coming from, and then demand of the governments that they clean up. And all of this then is predicated on the Clean Water Act. That is what our backbone is that we can say you cannot pollute these waters. And so we've had a number of uh, our chapter, a little chapter on the island of Hawaii, has gone uh, with earth justice to many different lawsuits. One of the most noticeable that went to the Supreme Court uh, not a couple of years ago was where the county uh, are dumping their uh, not totally treated wastewater into an injection well. It goes into the injection well, it's all gone, don't worry about it. However, it went into the groundwater and then the groundwater seeped out onto the beaches or the rocky coral reef coastline, causing eutrophication, introduction of alien species and totally destruction of that near shore area. The county said, we have no, it's not our responsibility. We have a permit to dump it down the well. It, down the well, it's gone. And the Supreme Court upheld the jurisdiction that there was a, a nexus of connectivity here, that they, they were responsible for it. The county fought this for a number of years and finally with the new mayor, finally just gave in and said that the Clean Water Act is supreme as determined by the um, uh, Supreme Court. We have, we have progressed through looking at agricultural work um, we have large uh, seed crops, genetically modified corn seed crops here, which are run by the chemical companies, Syngenta, Dow, and all of those guys. And they, their water, the runoff goes into ditches which drain into the ocean. And again, they said, hey, we're not responsible. Those aren't waters of the United States. They're just ditches. And we're saying, no, they're not. And we then went out and, and showed how many uh, nasty pesticides and nutrients and turbidity was in that water 
and have successfully then brought suits against them to say, yes, that they, uh, they are responsible for that. But it's again, only through the Clean Water Act. And we have an aquaculture firm that raises shrimp and they just dump their wastewater from there, filtered wastewater into ditches. Well, hey, it's no, it goes into ditches. No, it goes into the groundwater and onto the beach. It goes from a ditch into another ditch into the ocean. And so the point of discharge is not the ocean, it's where they pump from their tanks out. So I think um, there are many different things that we're, we've talked about here. Uh, the PFAS, uh, personal care products, um, we have many more chemicals that are coming up that we have to be concerned about that are not taken out by wastewater treatment plants. One of the other things that I'm really concerned about because I do a lot of work with marine debris is plastic pollution and the microfibers and nanoplastic. And uh, Patagonia um, works with Surfrider. We're partners and have been for 20 years. I love them. Uh, but they take all those plastic water bottles and make it into clothing that I wear, which then release all the nanofibers, which then get into the streams, which then are picked up by the trout that my grandson in Montana catches all the time. And you look in there and there's the chemicals and the microfibers. So we, the interesting thing from my point of view, and, and I'm sure from Ted's point of view and Patagonia's point of view, is that we have been trying to be responsible scientists for so long, but we never knew about nanoparticles and plastics. We never knew about these PFAS and other things that were in our waters. And so the Clean Water Act is something that's really evolving and, that, and it has to be able to take care of these new pollutants. And, and one of our projects now is simply to have EPA recognize that nanoparticles, plastic particles in the ocean are a specific pollutant that needs to be recognized and controlled. And, and that's gonna be an uphill battle. Um, I, I am really uh, fortunate. I live in Hawaii on a tiny little island, which I, I moved here uh, 30 years ago because I thought it was the most clean and wonderful spot in the world. And uh, I realized that the overpopulation is causing all these problems and the increased use of plastics and artificial sweeteners and other chemicals are really destroying the environment that we love here. But uh, it is, uh, from my point of view and Surfrider's point of view, the Clean Water Act is the, is the keystone for environmental protection for our environment. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you, Carl. Um, lots of lots of overlapping messaging around uh, connectivity and just the importance of these protections. And then I um, appreciate you ending with the emerging threats and what's going to be coming ahead. Um, I do want to, I'll just give one more plug for folks to put in questions. It looks like the questions that have already been asked in the chat have been answered thoroughly in the chat. So uh, if there are any others that folks would like to hear our panelists talk about, definitely throw that in there. I am going to um, put the action one more time. Again, we are in an active public comment period. Uh, the EPA and Army Corps of Engineers are hearing from the public right now. So I um, encourage you to sign up and fill that out and uh, make your voice heard and help us to then stand up and protect more, more of our waters. Um, and then I guess I'll just take it since we have a few minutes and we don't have any active questions in the chat, uh, just open it up and see if there are any, um, any other comments that panelists would like to address. I know Ted, you got called out in that last section, so you might want to <laughs> respond. No, I nothing else to add. I've really enjoyed. I think we've covered kind of a lot of ground. Interesting to see how there's there's a lot of intersectionality among the panelists, right? Each of us had a point of connection to another, either via our brand or our communities, or even the shared perspective on the, these places that we're coming at. I, I really enjoyed today. I hope the I hope those kind of viewing got a lot out of it as well. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, and we do have um we have a question from Yvonne. Uh, how do citizens rouse city politicians to do more? Um, and I actually, I'll, I think I'll test that to John. Well, I, I, that's funny. I was going to hand it off to Caitlin, but, um, sure. but I'll, I'll offer, I'll start with some good news, which is, you know, oftentimes um, 
our city and municipal decision makers are strapped by lack of resources. I mean, it takes a lot of resources to build sewage infrastructure, invest in green infrastructure, create new plans that are comprehensive and so forth and so on. Um, the great news is that the bipartisan uh, infrastructure law that Environment America advocated for at least includes some increase in the Clean Water State Revolving Fund. Um, we fought for more, we asked for a lot more than what we got, but uh, we'll take that incremental progress and we'll keep rolling forward. And in addition to that money directly in the bipartisan bill, I think folks know that there's literally hundreds of billions of dollars that the ARPA coronavirus relief uh, fund has given to states and to local governments. And um, one of the permissible uses for those ARPA funds is water infrastructure. And there are cities and towns that are tapping into those ARPA funds to invest in the kinds of um, solutions that we need to prevent pollution. So those are some opportunities, some really historic opportunities we have with federal funding that we've not seen in a long time. And I would um, add that Portland's a little unique because we have this really remnant form of commission government, um, but we do have really active environmental organizations and citizen groups and a very receptive city hall. Um, I would say that the most effective groups are the folks who understand how things work inside the city bureaucracies, who can really um, get into the meetings and really understand, like today's discussion, how you change a single definition in a federal rule has these ripple effects throughout every single municipality in the United States. Those are the kinds of um, sort of in the weeds folks that really are successful in moving the dial in cities. Uh, and that's a long game. It takes a lot of, of, of intelligence and support for folks to really do that. Um, so be patient, it won't come easily and it changes with different administrations, but it's really important to keep at it. And then I would say uh, secondarily is to find your allies who work for the city, folks like me and others who are trying to do this kind of work from the inside and find those partnerships that John just mentioned to really identify projects that you can move together with community support uh, through community benefits agreements or granting programs. Um, we have a number of examples of federal projects where we are relying on the community to really carry that message to DC, uh, specifically under the Water Resources Development Act. So to John's point, we actually don't use the state revolving fund at all because we can get a better rate on the open market given our bond rating. So we have other federal pots of money that we try to go after um, and use local match at a cheaper rate, but we need citizens to help us develop those projects and then carry that message back. Um, the other big piece, you know, environmental justice, environmental equity, and out in the Pacific Northwest, especially the tribal communities and tribal relations, having those uh, folks really carry the message and develop the projects that are going to have the most impact on this legacy of environmental harm to really vulnerable, at risk, and disproportionately impacted communities is really critical right now. So work with those groups to identify what those projects are. Um, and try to try to see if you can get a few off the ground to prove that they work. If it's okay, I'll add a little to that as well. I, I really agree with my panelist peers, you know, here in, in regards to finding somebody who's in the work right now and understands how the game gets played and adding your support there. There's an aspect of the Patagonia website called Patagonia Action Works that you can put in your address and you can search by cause. Maybe you care about fish, maybe it's water. Maybe it's climate crisis, maybe it's regen, organic agriculture. And the filter of will show you organizations that we have been supporting over 50 years that are in your town that are aligned with that cause. Yes, we very much appreciate that, Ted. Um, I'll let Eric address. There's a question in the chat from Francis, more of a comment, but I will let Eric, uh, Eric answer that. Very How about now? How about now? Yeah, uh, she was talking about take uh, uh, animals off uh, public land, and and I agree. What she has seen with 
with watershed damage and uh, point pollution, that, that is indeed with the way conventional grazing is done. But now with regenerative type grazing, all the Western lands were, were formed under a grazing animal. And the problem is not the cow, it's the how. It's how they are grazed. You know, we work with a lot of great, I mean, big operations out West. And, and all you have to do is take a look at some of our uh, public lands that are in very brutal environments. When you take the grazing animal off it, they actually degrade more. But again, if you overgraze them, do not move livestock, keep them keep him like the herds of buffalo were done, you degrade them as well. But you can, it's never an either or in nature. We can have both. And, and I'm not concerned about the beef production that comes off that. I'm actually concerned about the degradation of the land when the livestock comes off. And I'd be glad to reach out to Frances uh, individually and show her more on that, show her the, the way that's done. But we are so used to seeing grazing done conventionally that it is very destructive. But when it is done regeneratively, right, with the technology we got, you can really, really revitalize land. And I can show her some case studies in Chihuahua Desert down in New Mexico with one of our consultants that it is amazing what you can do to regenerate desert lands with livestock. And thank you for that question, Francis. Thanks, Eric. Uh, I think... We're getting a couple more questions. So we have, uh, are there any successes in suing city governments where development codes continue to degrade surface waters? So segments do not meet their state uh, GMO? Go John. Um, I'm sure there are some out there. There are none that I'm specifically aware of. I think this question seems similar to the one that I answered earlier about the citizen suit provision of the Clean Water Act. You know, I think litigation is one tool um, and I'm going to talk, if I can, in just a minute about a successful use of that regarding agricultural pollution. But remember that most of these local elected officials, they are elected and they're, they should be accountable to voters. And, and, and so just plain old grassroots campaigning may be a more powerful strategy than going to court in some of these cases. Um, but I was going to just touch back on one, one thing that Eric had said about litigation. Um, we, uh, you know, unfortunately under the Clean Water Act, well, doesn't directly regulate runoff from, from agriculture. Um, point source pollution is regulated, whether that's from agriculture or chemical companies. And um, big companies like Tyson and Purdue do operate huge slaughterhouses and um, meat processing plants. Those all have permits under the Clean Water Act. And Pilgrim's Pride, which is one of the largest uh, chicken companies in the in the world, uh, has a plant in in Live Oaks, Florida, that was discharging um, pollution um, into the Suwannee River in Florida, and um, that pollution exceeded the limits in its permit. So we are and our state affiliate, Environment of Florida, uh, did file a citizen suit against Pilgrim's Pride. And what was great about that case is not only did we get this major company to clean up its act, but the majority of the $1.4 million settlement that came out of that case, we reached an agreement with the company that that money would, instead of going to the US Treasury, would go to a program to help local farmers improve their practices and prevent runoff pollution from their land. Some of those grants may have been regenerative soil practices. Some of them may have been uh, about, you know, reducing manure application. There were a whole range of things there, but we were able to sue a major polluter and then turn that into a program to prevent pollution and help farmers um, do what I think most farmers want to do, which is be stewards of the land. Excellent, excellent um, note to leave on. Uh, yeah, John, I'd like to add, add a little of that if I can. Is that all right, Christine? Uh, sure, we are at the top of the hour, so I'll just. Oh, I'm sorry, no, you go right ahead. No, that is fine. Oh, that's that's okay. If you have something quickly, Eric, go ahead. I, I would like to, to tell our panelists and thing and our guests, get, get involved in the, the farm bill as well. Unfortunately, the farm bill and the regulations in the farm bill is what perpetuates the problem with non-point source. They are paid 
unfortunately, to do what they're doing right now. You've got subsidized crop insurance, you've got CRP, all these programs perpetuate the problems, as John is agreeing with. So get them far, get them, get involved with the farm bill. It needs to be changed. We need agriculture, we need government out of agriculture in that regard, or at least in a way that promotes good stewardship. Because while farmers may say they want to save the environment, everything they taught, everything they're subsidized for does otherwise. So thanks for that, Christine. Eric, thanks for adding that. We'd love to uh, catch up with you after this webinar and get your thoughts on the Farm Bill. Sounds very interesting. Great. Well, so thank you everyone for joining. Thanks for the great questions in the chat and for everyone um, who's engaged and um, hopefully you got the chance to take that action and add your name and we'll, um, we'll, we'll continue to, to work on fighting to protect our water in the future. So thanks everyone for joining. Thanks, Christine. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Aww.